Hi everyone, we're about to um, kick off. My name is Kate and I'm going to be um, facilitating this session. So Ray, you're up first. Do you want to, um, uh, are your slides ready to go? Yes, thanks Kate. Okay, no worries. So um, feel free to, to share them um, and then I'll introduce you. Thank you. Okay, so um, thanks very much, Ray. So um, welcome to uh, the session, look, I've lost count of what session it is, session three or four of our uh, learning and teaching conference. My name's Kate. I'll be facilitating the five sessions today. So because we have a lot of uh, speakers, I'll keep the timing pretty tight and then we will have questions at the end. Uh, once again, a reminder to um, mute your microphones feel free to chat. The chat is recorded. And if we don't get through all of the questions, then we will find a way for the presenters to either engage or, um, you know, the great thing about online conferences, it's a great way to network and continue conversations at a later date. So in the first, our first speaker uh, is Ray, uh, Ray Jobst and Renee Durham from Griffith University, um, exploring online short courses as PD for academic staff. So over to you, Ray. Thanks so much, Kate. Um, and I mentioned this yesterday in another presentation. I just really appreciate um, the efforts that the team from CQU have done um, in putting this conference together. I was looking over the presentations that are scheduled for today and some amazing stuff. So um, thank you so very much for opening it up to other universities to be involved as well. It's very generous of you. Um, I uh, work with Griffith Online and Renee Denham is a colleague who is also an educational designer. Um, and Renee was the project manager for developing these courses um, and is on parental leave at the moment, so can't be here. But um, yes, so uh, today I'd like to talk with you about and share with you the Teach Online program of short courses that we developed. Um, and we launched these in 2018, last year. And um, so this page here, I think you'll be able to access this page, but enrolment in the courses themselves is restricted to Griffith staff. So I'll talk a little bit about um, those courses now. The, the brief was to uh, provide an opportunity for all Griffith staff, including sessionals who don't have a current contract, to gain skills in teaching online. And um, Griffith has a huge online component. Um, many courses, many students um, have taken an online course. And um, so we call courses, you, what you call units, I think many universities call units, we call a course and a degree is a program. So forgive me if I kind of, um, use a term that is confusing. Um, so the brief was to provide a learning opportunity that was as flexible as possible, that was brief, um, and that was grounded in the Griffith context around our policies in terms of teaching and assessment and so on, that had a way of um, being recognised and was valuable for academics' portfolio. And at the moment, we're, um, we're uh, working through a micro-credential process. Um, so that's with... Um, Griffith has a, an agreement with Credly and has a, a digital badge um, product that will be associated with completing these courses. So we were looking at, we use Blackboard as our learning management system. We were looking at using Blackboard to deliver these courses, but the issue there was for academics who are sessionals who don't have a current contract, they don't have a login and so on. So we went and we were developing a whole suite of MOOCs with FutureLearn. So we chose FutureLearn as the platform to deliver these courses. The courses 
um, are open for enrolment anytime and they're designed to be completed in a, around four hours. And um, so they, um, we also schedule some live webinars that participants in those courses are welcome to come and join in. The webinars that we have scheduled for later this year will focus on linking teaching online with the newly released Griffith course design standards. So um, it's a way of academic staff thinking about how their courses meet those um, course design standards or what tweaks they might need to do to help their courses meet those standards. Um, and we also have facilitation. So FutureLearn has quite a good uh, way of presenting content with comments on the page and as do many MOOC platforms. And so we're involved in facilitating those discussions as they go along. Uh, so this is a colleague um, and her feedback was when we launch these courses, particularly on um, communica communication matters or conversation matters, we renamed it, the content and resources are relevant, professionally accessible and the highest quality. So the, the challenge was how we engaged people who were, you know, really super experienced at teaching online as well as those who were coming in um, to and new to teaching online. So our numbers so far, we've had 178 enrolments in conversation matters, 104 in assessment matters, and 129 in design matters. Now the certificates in FutureLearn, um, there's an option that the provider can add into their courses, which allows people to earn a certificate and to do that, they must achieve 70% um, in an online quiz and mark as completed 90% of the steps within the course. So that's um, a future learning parameter that is set. So um, we really encourage people to take advantage of that. So what's in the courses? Conversation matters. This is um, on the left is a screenshot from Future Learn, and as you can see, it kind of steps um, out each part of the course and it tells the participant, the learner, whether it's an article, whether it's a video article and so on. Um, articles, we also included activities in there as an article. There might be a template and so the activity would be completing that template. On the right hand side are some screenshots from videos that we created and we interviewed a whole range of people um, including people like Michelle who was from Griffith Business School, she was uh, Deputy Dean of Learning and Teaching, Christopher Klopper, another Deputy Dean in um, Arts, Education and Law and Fran is um, Dean Learning and Teaching in Griffith Sciences. So we also included people whose expertise is in curriculum advice, um, learning and teaching technology advice and so on. So these videos I, I felt were actually one of the most valuable things that, um, uh, that we produced as part of this program. Um, in FutureLearn, the um, language is very conversational. So um, we talk about things as if you're talking to the person. So very engaging um, content. That's what we were aiming for anyway. So um, for instance, here, all are welcome, even those on the edge. That particular article approaches the issue of how do you bring people in to a learning community, particularly online. We always have that active core. How do we expand that core um, out to the edge? Uh, so conversation matters, then design matters. Um, and you can see down the right-hand side that we've got a shot from the video interview with Jenny. Um, and then also some screenshots of a voice thread activity. So we used voice thread 
as and that took people through the um, and it was a really nice way actually of taking people through the different lenses that we have to look at when we're looking at learning outcomes. So we look through the lens of the Australian Qualifications Framework. We look through the lens of Bloom's Taxonomy and so on, the different lenses that we look through. Um, and the screenshot on the left, that shows you how you can, with the blue boxes, they've been marked as complete. So FutureLearn has a nice way of tracking your progress through a course and then you can easily click on the next um, step that you need to complete. Um, and we got some great feedback in here, particularly around things like learning outcomes. And, you know, if, if you're engaged with people talking about learning outcomes, sometimes it seems like such a dry thing to talk about, but it's really actually the backbone of your course design and so we take people through that. Um, that course also looked at aspects like universal design for learning and accessibility, how to write nice and clearly, and how to think about things from the student's perspective and design a good learning experience in the online environment. And the last course was Assessment Matters. Um, and again, the screenshot here is from FutureLearn. This is part of the course that looks at feedback. Um, again, that, that, that relates to not just online courses, but also on-campus or blended delivery. We talk there about, um, we've got a video where staff talk about um, feedback and um, how to give effective feedback. But in the video, what really matters most, we interviewed online students and they talk about what matters to them, how they pay attention to feedback. And um, again, that was a really great resource that we developed as part of that tool. Um, so the assessment part takes people through, you know, broadening their understanding of what's possible in terms of online assessment, not just thinking about written assignments all of the time, but thinking about um, can, does a video assignment work? We've been um, including assignment tasks like design of an infographic. So I'm just going to check my time. So about 12 minutes in. So um, infographics, um, having conversations and recording conversations with each other. There's a course that's running at the moment where um, students uh, reflected on, they use particular inventories to um, look at their personal leadership style, they reflect on that and then they have a conversation with another student about that. So that recording of their conversation with each other becomes an assessment task and that's what's assessed. So um, that's, I think, all of the slides. So thanks, Kate. Yeah, thanks. We've got actually um, three minutes for questions now or would, um, if anyone's got a burning question, otherwise we can uh, um, can go on. I've got some questions, I know, but um, so I'll, but I'll leave them till the end. <laughs> okay, thanks. And I know I haven't listed all of the, all of the content that is included in um, each course. I'm just mentioning Conversation Matters. Um, we talk a bit about use of Microsoft Teams and Yammer to build as tools for building learning communities. We talk about um, the community of inquiry model and Gilly Salmon's um, e-facilitation framework. So even though the approach is very conversational and using informal language, we build those frameworks in. Um, and we talk about in the step, even those on the edge, we talk about um, Etienne Wenger's concept of legitimate peripheral participation. So rather than talking about lurkers, we reframe that to say participating on the end, being edge, being an observer is still a legitimate way of participating. 
Um, so similarly in design matters, we bring frameworks in there as well. And in assessment matters, we talk about authenticity and problem-based learning and so on. Oh, thank you, Ray. I found that really fascinating. My question that I'll, um, I'll ask later is just about the relationship or how you work with FutureLearn, you know, so, so how you engage with, with, um, with that if, as, a, as a separate beast. So um, just maybe something to think about and I'll come back to that at the end of the, the session. So thank you. I really appreciate it. So if you'd like to stop sharing. And so we've got Samantha, um, Danny and Kimberly um, from the University of Sydney. So I know you're here, Samantha. So we're talking about um, your adventure triumphs and traps of a new modular approach to academic development. Okay, so um, yeah, I'm talking about a new modular professional learning um, framework that we've developed at the University of Sydney. Um, so just uh, as a starting point, um, I'd like to say it's not just me that's doing this, it's a, a small team of us at um, the Central Education Innovation Unit and we're located with the, within the DVC um, education portfolio. So jumping right in. There we go. Okay, so until recently um, at UCID, the professional learning landscape has resembled something along the lines of a uh, single torrential river essentially running in the same direction. That's the way that we've looked at it. Um, while we've had a number of different professional development programs um, running both centrally from within the university and also uh, various faculty-based um, training programs for academic staff to engage with. There's been a number of pain points across um, the university that still exist around the learning and teaching space. Um, the training that was currently on offer was one size fits all. It had limited flexibility and it didn't, most importantly, it didn't cater for the to the diverse range of staff that were currently being involved in teaching and learning um, activities at the university, be that the traditional lecturer or um, people in teaching support roles, casuals and se um, sessionals, all of those um, types of staff that um, also Ray was talking about in, in her talk just a minute ago. Um, it was also becoming clear that the training was not effectively helping meet the needs of the university, the sort of, sort of more strategic needs. Um, for example, uh, key teaching and learning initiatives around the quality of um, feedback and assessment and improving group work and um, fostering student self-belonging had not yet really re been realised. And so we were hoping that our new approach was going to address some of these needs as well. So don't be overwhelmed by this um, particular slide. So in June um, 2019, we launched the new um, professional learning uh, framework that um, I'm talking about now called the Modular Professional Learning Framework or the MPLF for short. So this is um, university-wide and open to all, um, all people involved, all staff involved with teaching and learning at the university. The intention of the MPLF um, was to extend that um, professional learning to anyone, um, coordinators, sessionals, academic focus um, staff, professional staff, and most importantly, um, offer a, a flexibility, increased flexibility and choice around the types of professional development they're um, going to engage with. So it's more structured and suited to their particular needs. We designed the MPLF um, Currently, we've got 19 separate modules um, that exist as discrete standalone units, um, and they're, they're, uh, they're tasked to be around about two hours to complete. They can be taken um, in a variety of different formats, depending on the module itself, whether that be blended, online, or face-to-face. -face. The majority of them are in the blended mode where you do a little bit of pre-work, a face-to-face -face workshop, and a bit of post-work submission as well. Um, the modular nature of the um, MPLF has been particularly useful and allowed us to bring in not just the traditional things um, that we want to hit, say, around assessment and, and group work, but also some um, of the more modern challenges for university teaching and learning, such as research, research and ethics in um, evidence-based teaching and learning, creating educational media, um, online tools for interactive and collaborative learning, all of these types of things we can build in quite easily and um, as we're going and developing um, this particular program. And as I mentioned, it's open to, to anyone at the staff involved in teaching and learning. 
So within these 19 modules, staff can take one module, they can take all 19 if they're particularly keen. But what um, we have done in consultation with um, faculty and um, those involved with curating teaching and learning activities across the university is come up with five curated pathways, um, particular for those different types of staff members. So targeting those different types of staff members. So you can see on the screen here at the top, we've got the five different pathways. So PNP, which is principles and practice, first year coordinators, tutors, um, education focused staff, and then educational designers and support officers. So they're the five sort of target areas that we're going for. And staff can take any of those um, particular pathways depending on who they are, um, but we encourage them to pick one that's most relevant, relevant for them. And within those pathways, they choose um, a series of core, so they have to complete the module, selective, so select two of, of three that we've picked as highly recommended, and then um, make up the rest as elective modules. Um, and then at the end, come together with 12 modules from that pathway in order to get the, the um, MPLS certificate for principles and practice, say, or tutor training. So that's the general sort of layout for that. And so by the end, um, they've got a curated set of, of modules that are targeting their learning needs for their particular staff um, profile. So when we were designing and developing um, the MPLF, we um, also had uh, a set of sort of things that we wanted to hit and we mostly drew on Malcolm Knowles um, theories of adult learning. So the six assumptions around adult learning. So the need to know um, that giving um, adult learners or, or our participants a reason for learning what they are, founding it very much in their experience. So based on what they are currently doing as practitioners in teaching and learning, um, allowing them to have some control and decision-making around their, um, their learning experience, making it particularly relevant for their context orientating it around problem-centred um, learning rather than just content-centred learning, but still having those frameworks and um, the, the stuff from the literature somewhat built into the, the delivery, but founding that very much in a um, relevant context for um, what the learner is doing. And then also mo uh, ho hopefully motivating um, our, our participants by making it so um, relevant to what they're doing. So for example, this um, these are two, uh, an image from one of our sessions around um, developing blended and online learning modules. So each, all the participants are given activities that they are drawing on their own experiences and redesigning certain aspects of their courses that they're either teaching or supporting teaching um, at that particular time. And so every activity is very much tailored to the individual who's coming to the session. And so they're able to take something away with it in less than an, an hour and a half and um, go and directly apply it to their own teaching context. And the, um, the, the image at the bottom is um, from our storyboarding session around uh, the learning outcomes and um, and creating better better aligned units. And so you can see, again, it's very much related to the individual staff member and what they're doing in their particular context. And then um, in saying all of this, we've created uh, the, these individual modules that are drawing from the literature, from current practice. And so we, we'd be very remiss if we, oh, we've skipped over, if we didn't um, sort of, credit some of the influence and inspiration that we've got from um, around the sector and in the literature itself. And so we'd like to just put it out there and say thank you to all these wonderful um, programs that are um, have open source material that we're able to go and get inspiration and see how others are doing it. And then rework it into a, into a Sydney focused um, model um, catering for our particular, our particular needs and staff's needs. So essentially at the end of all that, um, we only began in July, so it's only fairly new at this, this point, but we like to think of it that we're changing the professional learning landscape at Sydney from that single torrential river to more of an interconnected deltaic dynamic feel um, where we're shifting to, to meet the needs and cater for the individual needs of our staff and, um, and support staff that are involved in teaching and learning across the, the university landscape um, at this point. So just some outcomes, uh, it's less than four months old at this point, but we've had um, over 300 enrolments in our Canvas site. That's how we're sort of delivering our online 
um, space. We've had over a thousand registrations in individual sessions. And since July, we've done 24 sessions at this point. We've done an intensive block and then also are rolling out sessions across the semester at key points targeted to particular. So in week four, we have our first major assessments usually coming out. So we try and hit the assessment module in week two so that we're getting people to think about um, different and, and um, new ways of looking at assessments and those kinds of things. We've had some really nice um, written feedback. We're collecting feedback on every individual module that we've been presented as we go, um, both from um, qualitative statements and then also um, asking uh, participants how the sessions were useful for their current teaching activities. So 93% at this point have either agreed or strongly agreed that this, um, what they've learned is relevant and useful for their current teaching activities. And uh, uh, just shy of 90% have said that the teaching and learning activities have helped them learn effectively. So we're taking that as, a, as an encouraging place to be at this stage. We're obviously continuing to tweak and and mix things up as we go so that we're keeping it in that sort of dynamic um, changing to meet needs uh, of our particular staff members and what they'd like to have in the sessions. And so it's um, going well so far, but the question that I'd like to maybe pose to you guys, you don't have to answer right now, but while it looks like it's been impactful and useful for our staff at this stage, um, we'd really like to hear any, any more about how do you measure the impact of what we're doing not just on our staff but on the end user <coughs> our students that's where we're going um next and what we'd like to sort of hope that that this is making a difference for our students and how and their learning and teaching experience so yeah so i just thought i'd leave it there and if there's any questions i'm more than happy to answer them otherwise um yeah thank you for having me <laughs> Thank you, Samantha. I'm, I'm really fascinated as to how differently we all do it, you know, which is really demonstrates actually how different we all are and how contextual um, and how we're, we're working to really address the, um, the very contextual requirements of our individual institutions, because while we all look the same, we're actually all very, very different. So thank you. I thought that was a fascinating um, presentation. We actually have a couple of minutes for any burning questions, if anyone has any burning questions. Um, sorry, I just forgot to mention one thing. At the bottom of these slides, there's um, our links to both uh, myself and Danny Liu, who was one of the other key people involved, if you would like to get in contact, or if you'd like to read more on the program, we've got a, an open source blog, which we've um, written this up for. So that's all my, my last plug. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Thanks. You'll get a few more Twitter followers, I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> all right. No final, no final questions. So if you'd like to stop sharing your yep. screen. No Thank you. And um, I will then introduce our next group. Uh, these from Siki University. So, um, oops. Uh, so we have Ritesh, Robert, Stephanie, Monica, Masood, and Anthony uh, on cross cultural challenges in teaching and supporting subcontinent students, um, looking at the views of academic and professional staff. So I can see Ritesh. So, um, Ritesh, are you going to present? No, we've got Robert online. Oh, Robert? Robert, Robert's there. I, I did see him. Okay. Unless, uh, Robert, uh, yeah, you Robert. Yep. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, would you like to share your screen, Robert? Yeah, just. Okay. How's that? Can you see that? Perfect. Yep. So once again, I'll give you a um, sort of a 12 minute uh, warning if you need it. Um, otherwise, look forward to hearing your talk. Thanks, Kate. Um, this is uh, a presentation done by uh, six uh, people, uh, f five of them are from CQU. So all these, this presentation is a combination of the efforts of all these people. So just to start off with what I thought I'd just, or by way of introduction, um, I'd just say what motivated this study in the first instance. Um, the reason why we, we discussed the program is because CQU, um, particularly the School of um, uh, Business and Law and the School of Engineering, have large number of subcontinent students enrolled in their programs. And what we thought is we wanted to ensure that these students get value for money in relation to you know, the large fees they pay uh, when they come to Australia. 
And so to help this out, what we thought we'd do is we try and seek the views of academic staff and professional staff about what they thought were the challenges faced by this cohort of students with the view of trying to improve the teaching of these students. So that was the motivation for setting this project in train. Now, what I'll do is um, I'm going to go through a few slides and a bit of animation, and then I'll just talk about the slides as a combined effort. But hopefully this works. <laughs> So um, just, just by way of uh, background, these, these first couple of animations I go, there are, there are two general animations and then I go from these general animations into the animations that make them specific to CQU University. So the first of these, and, and we'll call these um, uh, issues, what we're looking at is we'll call them external issues. Um, so the first of these external uh, probably issues or pressures might be a better word, the external pressures. So in relation to the first pressure, the first pressure relates to the continued growth of student numbers from subcontinent Australias into Australian universities. For example, in 2017, more than 431,000 international students were enrolled in Australian institutions. And that figure represented a 10%, uh, more than a 10% increase on the previous year. Uh, most of these students are studying uh, commerce, management, um, technology related subjects, engineering subjects. So therefore it makes it particularly relevant to the authors of this, this particular presentation. Um, so that was the general pressure that faced um, by um, staff. And we'll then flick into having a look at how this pressure becomes specific to CQ University. And in relation to CQ University, we've got very large numbers, particularly the metropolitan campuses of um, students from subcontinent countries. Um, and most of those students, particularly at the metropolitan campuses, are enrolled in subjects or programs um, that come out of the uh, School of Business and Law and the School of Engineering and Technology. So, and then we all shift on to the second pressure and the second pressure really relates to um, a pressure that's generated from a particular standard. In other words, the higher education standards framework standard requires staff to engage in scholarship activities to address the educational needs of international students. Um, and now relating that general um, pressure to the specific aspects of CQU, um, um, all staff, including academic and professional staff, must be able to recognise and address the distinctive needs of this cohort of sub students from the subcontinent countries. Um, in fact, in 2015, six, uh, the Australian Universities uh, Quality Agency, ACWA, uh, recommended that CQU increase its emphasis on academic professional development in a variety of ways. So in other words, what the ACWA wanted uh, CQU uh, professional academic staff to do is to address the, sp the specific needs or one of their uh, um, objectives was to address the specific needs of international students in the form of better curriculum development, better forms of assessment, better, better ways of engaging with this cohort of students. So these two um, external um, pressures somehow need to be reconciled. That is, we need the increase in student numbers from subcontinent countries needs to be reconciled with the requirements of the higher education uh, standards framework in terms of addressing the distinctive needs of international students. That is the needs associated with English, 
uh, learning and communication skills. Now, one of the first steps in this reconciliation process is to understand the cross-cultural challenges faced by academic and professional staff in teaching and supporting subcontinent students. The reconciliation process, this reconciliation progress, be, uh, uh, brings us to the aims, the aims of the study. And the aims of the study uh, that we, we are undertook was to improve the cross-cultural awareness of staff about the challenges faced by um, subcontinent students and hopefully at the end of this process we we intend to develop um, a learning kick or uh, a learning resource kit um, and a uh, roll out a uh, professional development program to inform staff of the best ways to address the needs of the of uh, the subcontinent students so to achieve this aim what we did is we sought the uh, views of um, uh, academic staff and professional staff to help design this information kit and roll out a professional development program package. Now, so next we'll go on and have a look at the, the literature uh, review and the methods used to address this particular study. Um, Firstly, what you should recognise is the cross-cultural issues in higher education is well documented. However, they tend to concentrate on the learning styles of students, in other words, rote learning versus independent learning. They tend to concentrate on the uh, attitudes towards teachers. In other words, do international t um, students view teachers as a facilitator or do they just uh, view them as an authority figure? Um, the literature, uh, the past literature, also has a tendency to concentrate on the language skills of international students, their communication styles um, of international students, uh, the academic skills related to integrity, in other words, plagiarism, contract teaching and the like, um, and the adoption of personal the adoption to personal and academic life within Australia. So as you can see, and most of, or if not all, that literature um, is looking at it from the student's perspective. So that the past literature tends to concentrate it from a student's perspective. There is a paucity of literature that looks at the challenges from the other side of the education equation. In other words, arts, the teachers. Um, as I said, it tends to look at it from the student's viewpoint and not from the teacher's viewpoint. Um, in addition to this, there was virtually no literature that examines the um, perspectives uh, of subcontinent uh, students. Most of the literature does that does look at it from um, a, a, a student's perspective, looks at it from the, the viewpoint of Chinese students. So none from the uh, subcontinent countries. Now this shifts us on to the second um, um, PowerPoint there, which is related to the methodology. Now the methodology used to obtain data to complete this current study was via semi-structured focus group interviews. In total, uh, we conducted eight focus groups uh, interviews. Um, four of them were from academic staff um, and the other four were uh, focus groups were related to professional staff. In total, we interviewed 50 uh, people um, were involved in the focus groups. 29 were from the academic staff, both full-time and casual. And in relation to professional staff, uh, all 21 professional staff were full-time participants or, or employees. So what we used in relation to the methodology is we used uh, uh, a thematic analysis was used to identify analyze and interpret themes gathered from the focus group interviews. The data was analyzed in terms of themes using the framework method, which saw data being firstly 
uh, transcribed after the um, focus group sessions. We trans transcribed it, then we codified it, uh, we classified it into em emerging themes, and once the framework was finalised, the manuscripts were organised and classified under the coding, for coding themes using N Enviro uh, software. Uh, finally, your interpretation was carried out, which involved summarising the data. So let's um, now shift on to the last couple of overhead slides. Uh, what were the findings and conclusions in relation to the focus group or the studies that we carried out? Um, the thematic analysis um, um, identified four main themes. Uh, the first of these themes um, uh, identified staff views in relation to the characteristics of subcontinent students. Now, in relation to these characteristics, um, several characteristics were highlighted. Uh, the first of these characteristics relate, related to the respect for teachers. Um, it seems as though uh, subcontinent students um, uh, pay high respect to teachers. I wish it could happen to me, but uh, they often call me, call um, academic staff professors when they're really not. But uh, that's the they seem to respect and uh, the uh, contributions of um, academic staff. Now there is a downside to this because with so much respect uh, offered to um, uh, teachers in the higher education system, they have a tendency not to challenge. Um, the, the views of academic staff and they just sit back and listen rather than become involved in, in the discussions. Uh, the second um, characteristic seems to be that of continual guidance. Um, in other words, subcontinent students seem to need a lot of guidance. Uh, they have problems scoping a particular project. They're always asking for guidance and assistance in relation to assessments. Um, uh, exams and other forms and, and other class class issues. Three minutes, Robert. Okay. There, there's also a tendency to group students. In other words, um, uh, group students. Uh, there's a propensity to negotiate, particularly for marks. Uh, and there also seems to be uh, forms of male dominance. In other words, particularly Indian students, if they want to ask questions, they have a, uh, um, a, a, pr a propensity to ask only questions of male staff. Um, uh, what are the views and challenges? Um, there, there, there seems to be an inability uh, to develop appropriate study skills. Um, there's a tendency to rote learn as opposed to uh, trying to do some critical thinking in relation to those skills. There's a lack of communication skills, whether that's due to the lack of respect for teachers, lack of independent thinking, uh, lack of engagement with faculty and other staff. And that has a downside because we think uh, international students or people from subcontinents countries are being aloof. Uh, then there are views associated with academic integrity, the main one being uh, plagiarism, and the more topical one at the moment is in relation to uh, contract teaching. The other uh, finding is in relation to the push or, or, or the decision, are students here to learn or are they here for permanent residency um, issues? in relation to seeking visas. So just by way of conclusion, um, what we need to do is with all these characteristics and views, we need to put these together and try and, de and, try and demystify the cultural assumptions and biases, uh, particularly in the context of the large cohort of international students. So what we are thinking of doing, once we gather these views of staff, what we thought we could do is develop a, a, um, a, uh, an information kit or a resource kit to, f to pass on to academics so that they can at least be aware of the issues faced by international students 
We're also considering developing a professional development package that we can roll out to around campuses at CQU. Um, so thank you very much for listening to me. And if there are any questions, um, I'm welcome to listen to them. Um, we've got other uh, presenters or invo people involved in the, the this this project. So if they want to help answer the questions, they're welcome to help out as well. Thank you, Robert. I've I've I know I've got a question. Um, so um, conscious of time, so we'll we'll leave the questions to the end. So just um, either I put them in the chat and I'll go through them or make a note of it. So I've got a question about the perceptions of um, visa seekers versus genuine students and and how the students perceive that and how that gets managed by staff. So, um, but again, you know, I think confirms. It's lovely when research is either con confirmatory, which I think is con uh, confirms a lot of the anecdotal discussion that many of us have about some continent students, but also then um, you know raises some uh, new new knowledge, which is uh, which is awesome. So thank you very much. Really appreciate uh, the presentation. So our next presenters. So otherwise, um, our next presenters are another fabulous CQU team: uh, Jenny, Bobby, and Caroline from CQU University, talking about. Are meeting the deep needs of domestic non-English speaking students who transition to university via our STEPS program here at CQ University. So, um, yeah. so hello everybody. I'm presenting this uh, uh, summary of a, a project that I've been doing with a couple of colleagues. My good friend and colleague Bobby Harold is in the audience there. Do you want to say hello, Bob? If you're still there. Um, hello, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Good to see your smiling face there. Uh, and Caroline Henderson Brooks is the other person who was involved in this project. So you'll see that it's um, a project that was funded by a SALT grant. So we're very grateful to the university for that um, support. And it's really great to have the opportunity to talk about some of the findings to a wider audience. So you can see that we uh, follow on nicely from the, the talk that we've just heard. But it's a slightly different lens that we're bringing to this, um, similar but different um, set of needs and, and things to think about um, as staff members. So we wanted to look at how we could meet the needs of domestic students from non-English speaking backgrounds or NESB students. And in particular, to look at the ones who are coming to university via the STEPS enabling program. So the STEPS program is our pathways or bridging program here at Central Queensland University. So it's a small um, project, but we think we have some interesting things to share. Um, and clearly it's the conversation that people are interested in uh, and one that's worth having. So what do we mean by NESB students? Well, we're not talking about international full fee paying students here. Uh, according to a government report, we are referring to all students who use a language other than English at their permanent home residence. That's a slippery de definition because some students uh, will have English as their second or even third language, but still speak it at home. So really pinpointing he who these students are is problematic. Um, and also in our data systems, we don't necessarily know who these students are. It's not necessarily recorded. Um, unlike the international students, we don't have reliable sets of data. There isn't as much written about um, NESB students. We know much more from the literature about international students. And so from a, a staff perspective, we won't necessarily know who these students are. Uh, we won't necessarily know from their names or the way they look or sound. Uh, and in online cohorts, of course, that's even more challenging. So they can be quite an invisible group. And as um, one of the staff members we interviewed said, they can slip through the cracks. So in our study then, we used a participatory action research approach. So we tried to involve the students in the research process. And we, when we had some preliminary findings, we fed them back to the students uh, and uh, also to some staff members to find out what they thought and, you know, to get some clarification from them. It's a small study. Um, we conducted semi-structured interviews with 11 NESB students 
who were in the STEPS program or STEPS course, and then 10 who had um, come through STEPS and were in their first year of their undergraduate study. So they were from a range of courses, um, and we also followed up then with interviews with five of those students again to get their feedback on our findings so far, and we talked with five academics. So those academics were from the Academic Learning Centre, uh, as well as undergrad, and of course, from the STEPS program. So our original intention with the, the interviews was to do them all via Zoom. We thought that would be a really neat way to record and also to be able to use uh, the non, you know, to be able to factory non-verbals in the communication, especially as most of these interviews were conducted from a distance, not face-to-face. -face. Not as many students agree to that as we would have hoped for, and most of the uh, interviews were conducted by phone. This particular student obviously agreed to be uh, to the Zoom interview, and she's also given us permission to use her image here. Just one of the many beautiful students we interviewed uh, and she talked about how grateful she was for the opportunity to come to Australia and study. She was doing steps at the time. But she also talked about how it felt like she was starting from zero in some ways. Um, she has a degree, a university degree from her country of origin. That's not recognised here. So she has to start all over. Um, she doesn't have a huge network of friends and she really misses her family. So she was just one of the, the many, one of the students that we interviewed and we got to know her story. They all have a story to tell. Uh, and one of the things that I think was really interesting about the study is just realising the diversity within this group. It's actually really hard to profile them for that reason because they come from many different backgrounds, um, many different parts of Asia, from Pacific Islands, from Europe, um, all over the globe. They're a very diverse, diverse group and they may have been in Australia for very different lengths of time. So some will have done some of their schooling here in Australia and some will come much later. Some, like the student I just showed you, will already have a degree from their country of origin. So a really diverse uh, really diverse backgrounds and so too with their levels and proficiency with English. But one thing that was common amongst these students, even when they seemed to speak and understand it very well, that they all lacked confidence with their English. And of course, academic writing is a particular concern and that's been talked about by um, uh, Robert and Ritesh in the previous presentation. But they also feel vulnerable in a number of other contexts as well. And one student said, the thing you should know is that in class, some students that I know, and they're talking about students from non-English speaking backgrounds, they're too shy to speak. So I noticed that one of the comments there was about students being reluctant to speak in class when they don't have English as their first language. And sometimes this is just because they are really shy uh, and they are really not confident in, in using their English. IELTS is a huge obstacle for some of these students if they don't, the English proficiency testing, of course, um, if they don't have any schooling here in Australia, then even having done steps isn't enough, they will have to uh, meet those requirements for, um, from the, that IELTS testing. It's an expensive process, it's time consuming, and some of these students are really quite terrified of it. So that remains a huge obstacle for many of them. Um, and they wonder if they'll ever really fulfil their, fulfil their dream of studying uh, at university here in Australia because of the IELTS test. They can feel very alienated. As I said, they won't always have good support systems. Um, this student talked about how she felt that sometimes people put her in the other box, a mental wheelchair, um, that feeling of otherness. And this student has been in Australia for a number of years. She's married to an Australian. Her children are Australian born. And yet still she feels that sense of alienation. They can really struggle with time. And of course, a lot of our students struggle with time. That in itself is nothing uh, extraordinary. But these students not only have a number of life roles, but then they also have the added constraint of it takes them longer 
to process information, the reading can take them longer, and certainly writing intensive tasks um, can take them longer, at least that's very much their perception. So they can really struggle with time. And of course, they can lack those support systems. Um, they, their family might live very far away and they may not have uh, a lot of, of support here in Australia. This quote is from a newly arrived refugee, and I should have mentioned earlier that refugees are also part of the NESB cohort in STEPS. Uh, and this student said, for some reason, I don't have any friends from anywhere in Australia. I'm getting support from lecturers. So you can see that they are vulnerable in a number of ways. It's not just about their language. Um, and this, the lecturer's support is really a lifeline for, uh, for some of these students, uh, many of them. Um, and so they seem to be very happy with the support they were getting from our lecturers, which is reassuring, whether that was online or on campus. But the lecturer is a really important uh, part of their, of their journey, of their academic journey. So what can we do? Well, look, there's no silver bullet here. It's a small scale study, so we're reluctant to be too dogmatic about providing a list of recommendations. But here are some things to think about, and some of these will follow on from what has been talked about in the previous uh, presentation. We need to use clear English, and we know these days that you know, good communication is about saying something clearly, not necessarily um, making it obscure with a lot of intellectual sounding jargon. Certainly there's a certain amount of technical terminology that's inevitable, but we should be trying to keep the way we uh, communicate clear, that's in our writing and also verbally. Let's not forget about using visuals to back up what we're saying. I think sometimes as academics, we can become very dependent on PowerPoint. We can forget about good old whiteboard and explaining things, writing keywords and key terms up on the board as you were going. Um, just simple things like that can make the world of difference. We should always be checking for understanding. We don't just explain something once or even twice. Uh, if it's key concepts, if we want to know if students really understand the assessment task, ask someone in the class to tell you what their understanding of it is and you can always uh, clarify what they've said. And that's not just picking on any SB students, of course. These are strategies that can work across the board. They can be very effective for the broader cohort as well. We can appreciate that these students do have particular needs. Um, they may need extra time for things. Uh, they certainly will feel vulnerable in a lot of ways, so we can be providing them with encouragement. Kindness can go a long way with vulnerable students. As to how much extra time you're willing to put in with these students, how much extra support, I think it's really hard to um, give any kind of rulings on that. It will very much depend on the context we had a discussion, for example, uh, in a small focus group with um, academics about whether being an NESB student was grounds for needing extra time for an assignment, for an example. And there were some in the group who thought, yes, that would be a valid reason. But of course, if you have a lot of international students, as clearly some of you do, and maybe some domestic NESB students in the mix as well, well, that may not be practical. And I do think a lot of this comes down to individuals and their own worldviews on what they think uh, is the right kind of support that is offered for students. But it is hard to create rules about this, I think. But certainly we can direct students, undergrad students, to the Academic Learning Centre and similar support um, centres at other universities. But of course, that's not the whole solution as well. And um, people who work in ALC uh, will make it clear that they're not a proofreading service. There's only so much um, that they can do to help these students. We can encourage students to use Studiosity, which is that grammar check that's uh, embedded into our Moodle sites. And also be aware of sites like Grammarly, which students can find really uh, useful. And that will also give them some grammar um, advice. We can certainly try to help students feel valued and included, remembering that they may feel very vulnerable. So on campus there are things that we can do to try and encourage their participation, remembering that these students will have a story to tell, that we can really celebrate that diversity by getting to know these students, encouraging them to share their stories, 
Um, simple things like think pair share, where you ask students um, in a pair to uh, talk on particular discussion points before sharing with the whole group. It's a simple strategy, but it's one that can work well with ESB students because they have time to process and even practice what they want to say before they share with the wider group. We also, in our focus group, talked about buddy systems where you might put stronger students in with less strong students in terms of their English ability in group work or pair work, etc. So they're just some of the inclusive strategies that we can use on campus. It is harder online to necessarily get to know our students, but we can certainly follow some basic principles. We can help make our Moodle spaces welcoming. We can use a warm and friendly tone in our communications with students. Um, the students we interviewed talked about how much they appreciate videos. So a video uh, of a lecture recording, for example, they might watch two or even three times. They can control the pace, they can pause, they can go back, they can check definitions of words if they need to, really appreciated by NESB students. And some of these students talked about how much they appreciated Zoom workshops, lectures, the chance to ask questions and the chance to feel a part of the group. Again, those are just some of the techniques that we can use. How am I going for time there, Kate? Okay. Oh, you've got about a minute, Jen. <laughs> cool. And I think one of the take home messages uh, for me from this study is that we really need to recognise the potential of these NESB students. We can tend to see them as a problem set um, that they may need extra time, they may be high maintenance. Um, and I think we have to check our assumptions, always be mindful of our assumptions. Just one, one story stands out to, to me with this project. Uh, one of the STEP students I talked to was very nervous about having to do her academic writing subject. And I was trying to say to this student, because she really had quite a strong accent and she was a little bit hard to understand. And I'm saying, look, you might have to let go of your perfectionism because clearly she wanted to get those HDs. I said, you know, you, you might find it really a bit hard to get an HD in academic, your academic writing subjects. But, you know, I followed her progress because she was such an interesting person, clearly so capable. And, you know, she did really well in her academic writing subject. Her English was a little bit bumpy but her level of thinking, her critical thinking skills were off the chart. She was a really intelligent woman. She also had a degree from her country of birth. So I think we, we always have to be mindful of our assumptions and realise that, you know, these students can really have a lot of, a lot of potential. So I'll leave it at that, unless Bob would like to jump in and clarify anything or say anything at this point. Bob? No, Jen, I think you've said it all. Thank you very much. It's great. Thanks. Thank you, Jen and team. That was really, really fascinating. And, um, you know, there were some comments there in the, uh, about diversity and also about the fact that, um, you know, in my project that I'm currently working on, we talk about designing for the fringes. And when we design for the fringe, where those students who find it most difficult to engage, then you kind of bring everybody along on the journey as well because you make it easier for everyone. So there was some comments there about low literacy and num numeracy um, as well. Um, you know, and that diversity piece of developing an inclusive classroom. So thank you. That was um, really great. Empirical research is always really good and a reminder of, of how important it is to actually talk to our students about their experiences, um, you know. So, yes, thank you to Jen and team. So we now have um, time for questions. So uh, there haven't been too many questions come along the chat because you've been busy chatting to one another, which is awesome. So if anyone has any specific questions for any of the speakers, um, let us know. So because it's difficult for me to see everybody, the best way to do that is probably just um, either um, open up your mic and talk or um, just let me know that you have a question in the chat. Otherwise, I've got two specific questions. No? Okay, so I'm, I'm lucky because I get to ask a couple. Uh, so the, <laughs> the first one is, um, was related to the future learn. So I mentioned, um, Ray, that, um, you know, some of us, for example, at Siki University, we've got our own embedded, we're distance ed, so, so we've got our own embedded, um, you know, systems. 
But I know that some of the universities, um, such as, you know, yours, have got different relationships with different providers as to how they engage with CPD. And, um, you know, some of some academics report that that can be a disjointed experience and some others say it's not at all. So, yeah, just curious about that relationship that you have and how you engage with the unit or how you develop that. Um, thanks, Kate. We um, have developed a whole suite of, um, and when I say we, so I didn't explain Griffiths Online, our role is kind of, we're kind of like internal consultants, if you like. So um, teaching teams approach us about developing their courses for online delivery. And so a partnership was formed with FutureLearn to develop a suite of MOOCs. And I guess um, I can't give you numbers about um, the numbers of students. We had right around the time Bohemian Rhapsody came out, we had a great um, uh, course that opened called Bohemian Rhapsody, um, something about why does music matter to our psychology or, you know, something like that. So that was great. We had several thousand people enrolled in that. Um, I guess the university was, went into that, like many, to see what the value was going to be in terms of attracting new students. Probably that, and reading, I've done a lot of reading about that, that's probably not as um, valuable as people hoped but um, what one of the big values I've seen is the different way of designing a course so FutureLearn have very clear um, standards that you must meet for their for your course to be offered on their platform so everything must be accessible a video doesn't go on FutureLearn's platform without captions um, you must have alt text that fully describes an image. So those non-negotiables, I think, um, have had a low payoff because the academic staff who have worked with our designers to put those courses together now have a really strong commitment to accessibility to that conversational approach of designing courses and so on. So I think that has been really good. We've also developed some courses have been joint with um, Deakin University. So, yeah, um, I'll find a yeah. link and I'll put it in the chat that lists the courses that we've put together. Thanks. That's really, yeah, that is really helpful, that raising of the standard. Um, you know, it's sometimes easier to do that when someone else is telling you what you need to do than when you're trying to do it internally. So, um, yeah, I appreciate um, that, that journey. So thank you very much, Ray. So Ina's got a question about to Ray and Samantha about the incentives to both continuing and sessional academics to enrol in your courses. So Samantha, would you like to start first? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so with uh, so with the continuing stuff, um, it's it's part of that. There's a bit of a carrot and stick kind of approach that we're taking. Um, some staff have to take it as part of their confirmation or as part of their ongoing um, academic progress reports, their yearly reporting sort of thing. Others are just, um, you know, keen and, and want to come along and um, improve their teaching and learning. And we, you know, we, we go and try and hit all of those uh, different um, types of staff members and make it relevant for them. In terms of the sessional academics, we're, we're very conscious about the fact that they're, often not paid to come to these things. So we've been working with faculties um, in some instances, particularly around the tutor training um, uh, pathways and trying to uh, uh, pair up with the faculties that used to offer tutor training programs that now are tapping into ours and they're willing to pay for some of the uh, um, the modules to be taken, but maybe not all of them. So it's we can't unfortunately pay for them, but um, the, the other incentive is um, certificates and, and uh, you know accreditation and and um, that kind of thing. So, but that's that's the most carrot stick kind of version that we've got going at the moment. Yeah, no worries. Thank you. Um, yeah, that that makes sense. So, Ray, how about with your um, with your courses? Um, there's no sort of incentive as such, although we really promote the 
building of a professional portfolio and also the Higher Education Academy Fellowship Program, that now called Advanced HE, that is really building strength in Griffith. And so as part of that, the Teach Online courses are listed as optional evidence, I guess, that people can gain. Yeah, we also have the same thing with ours, our work parallel along the way. I um, mentioned in the chat that our unit um, is separate to Learning Futures within Griffith and Learning Futures actually has the primary responsibility for professional development of academic staff. So we liaise with them and they were involved in sort of um, looking at the content and the development of the courses. They were in our little mini working party to make sure that we were our messages were aligned. Okay, great. Thank you very much to, to both of you. So that sounds... Um they're, they're, yeah, they're different, same, same, but different. Really, it's really interesting. And, and you know, we're the same across across the sector. It's really fascinating to get an insight and a, a genuine um, appreciation of your willingness to share because, um, you know, these are very competitive environments that we work in and um, being um, open to sharing and discussing is really important for all of us, actually, to, to be better teachers for all our students. So I appreciate that. Uh, so... I, again, have another question if we don't have anyone else. And that was actually just specifically to Ritesh and um, Robert. And it was just on one point in your, in your um, slide that intrigued me um, because rhetorically we know uh, with regard to... Uh, rhetorically we hear about um, subcontinent students coming and wanting visas. And the question that I had there is... Um, it wasn't clear as to the question about visa seekers versus genuine students. And I have the question is, do the students actually see themselves as genuine students, even though they are say, seeking visas? Because the question there is about, you know, whether we discount students as students because they're just seeking visas. Oh, well, you don't know, you know, they're not real students because um, they're just seeking a visa and, and therefore it, it's not real study. Was that something that came up or...? Uh Thank you, Kate. So we actually were trying to find out the motivators for subcontinent students coming here. So the yeah. question that we posed the staff, both academic and professional, was if they found what the motivators were. And most of the staff, both professional and academic, said they felt that permanent residence was one of the reasons. Now, if permanent residence was one of the reasons, and I'm just postulating this, the, the question as an academic is, how do I motivate a genuine student and someone who we think is here for a, for a visa? And yeah. there, are no, there are no answers. There was a recent study by Bob Birrell who said that universities are already adjusting their curriculum to accommodate the needs of today's foreign student. So it's not just subcontinent, it's students from South America, it's students from China, it's students from Vietnam. And I'm making that general point here now. And it is difficult to make that, that, that distinction. If the government was to take the sugar, and I'm calling it the PR sugar, off the table, will it affect the international education market? Yeah. It's a great question though, isn't it? Because you yeah. wonder what the worldview of an academic is in terms of approaching the students, because you would you would suspect that it does in fact influence the way an academic engages or approaches their classroom if they're making assumptions about the the um, self categorization of a student. So that student may well, in fact, be seeking a visa, but they also may well see themselves as a genuine student, you know. But some may not. So how do you, in fact, um, tease out that self identification of the student? Um, and then match it with the um, worldview of a um, of, of an academic, and then how they approach their study. So it's really fascinating area, I think. I mean, more of a comment there, um, Kate. Uh, see the issue of how to motivate these students, um, especially when we want them to be successful in their studies. Where if they have a different end goal, then what happens as a result is attendance yeah. dwindles in classes. You know. Yeah. A student who 
is or, or who's already made up their mind that their end goal is permanent residence then the question then is how do we motivate them um mm. are they necessarily going to perform to a high academic level that we'd expect them to you know as opposed to someone just trying to get a pass whereas you know or not putting in enough effort to to try and achieve higher grades but yeah, yeah it is a, a, a really difficult conundrum it is so ray's also given you a question did you find assumptions that you could challenge unfounded assumptions believe you know so did you find any question also did you find you could challenge unfounded yeah uh, so were there any surprises see, i suppose uh, one of i i i know it will quote one of the interviewers who said i guess we know 95% of our students i think are here for pr and even as a research team we were trying to contemplate whether we really put this in our paper but then see this is reality now for us so in other words someone has told us all these anecdotal evidence that kid you here i here we've got proof that people are telling us and the some of our sessional staff don't just teach at one university they're teaching at three or four different universities where they deal with similar cohorts and i've got michael um he was in a different study with with us and michael um had the same opinion so to to answer your question ray i mean i don't think these are unfounded assumptions anymore because now we have people who are telling us this and i'm sure you've heard other studies you know a simple google search will reveal similar outcomes but for for a different cohort and we are talking of the subcontinent cohort thank you thanks and michael's got his hand up yeah you muted michael okay yeah. oh yeah okay yes. um look um thanks ritish for uh, remembering me in your focus group i think this whole session um is way overdue uh, as i was listening to your presentation and the others i kept asking myself when are we going to address the big elephant in the room and in this case the room is the classroom and i've been on record for quite a few years for saying that there are a number of very big elephants in the room and i'm one of those sessional staff at cqu who also teaches in other universities in particular i teach at a very big melbourne based university uh which shall remain nameless because it is it is very very big and they i can tell you they have similar problems i go back to the point that uh, that was presented yesterday in the new academic identity um and uh and also this morning in the keynote address um when the uh, point was mentioned that we have a new managerialism in Australian universities and this new managerialism i can i think can be summed up by you know the bottom line approach i mean universities throughout australia love the smell of money and who can blame them uh and i'm very sympathetic to that so now i think this is a problem because you can't have your cake and eat it too i've been saying this for a very long time um and i feel for you ritish and your team because i think what you're doing is excellent excellent but you need to address that big elephant you say 95% of students are here for their permanent residency i would say at least 95% and i've taught many uh, classes uh and and i can tell you it is as high as that uh you know one of your comments you made in the chat group is you know we need to go back to the agents that recruit the students the agents that recruit the students to all australian universities they represent another big elephant in the room and what what's driving them what's driving them is the bottom line the, mm. you know the dollars i mean you know i mean i don't blame them if i was an agent i would put you know 
volume, way ahead of learning. And so I think the whole thing needs to be addressed. And I commend you and your team for doing this. Thank uh, you. And, yes. I, and I support that. that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I've met thank my point. Yeah. Thank you. Well, well thank, thank you. Look, it is a, it is a contextual problem. Um, yep. But I think that's what this, the research in this session really is trying to address is yep. that um, human factors, um, human factors are in the classroom every day, you know, and we are measured against our ability to teach. Um, and sometimes those human factors aren't considered as well as they should be, you know, why someone comes to class, how they engage with their classroom, what, that, that they're too shy to speak up, that they don't know how to use technology, et cetera. So our problem as academics on a daily basis is that we are not only having to try and engage these students, um, and we genuinely want them to be successful, but we're doing so in an extremely complicated academic context. So... Um, I really uh, applaud everybody in the session who has um, shared their knowledge. Are there any final questions um, for us before we close the session out? No, so look, thank you very much. Our next session, I've just reminded everybody that we've got an evaluation um, there if you would like to um, uh, tell us how much you liked one another's um, presentation. So uh, Sarah has sent it again. Uh, thank you everyone genuinely for being willing to share.